by the way, sorry for the funny voice I was in for the past week. Just wanted people to know why my voice like goes randomly. Welcome Dr. Merritt Moore. She's a quantum physicist and professional ballerina. She graduated with magna cum laude on honors in physics from Harvard and graduated with a PhD in quantum optics from the University of Oxford. In her professional ballet career, she's been with Zurich Ballet, Boston Ballet, English National Ballet, and Norwegian National Ballet. She was awarded Forbes 30 Under 30 and is now dancing and choreographing with robots. Welcome, Merit. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Zara. Of course. So just to start us off, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and when you had this first interest in physics and ballet, as I know you started ballet a little bit later than most ballet dancers. Yeah, so I actually, I was bribed by my mom to do ballet. I really wanted to do martial arts. I was 13 at the time and she was a double black belt. And so she was like, she wanted me to wait and like find a really good teacher. She was like, we need to fix your posture before you go into martial arts. So she was like, okay, deal is you have to do ballet for like three months. We fixed your posture. So you stop looking like your Korean grandfather, walking around like your Korean grandfather, and then you can do martial arts. So that's when I started ballet. And it just, the minute I started it, it just like hit me. I think it was a combination of, I didn't talk much as a kid. And so it was like the music and communicating with my body. I was like, this is so natural for me. Like, this is amazing. And so at that point, then my parents were like, okay, it's time to quit. And I was like, mm, not ready yet. <laughs> like, I like this. So I would say like, I guess dance started when I was 13. My love of math and science was from a young age. I think from my parents, they, they were not scientists at all. My dad's like, entertainment lawyer my mom was like stay at home mom but they like constantly I think encouraged us to love math and science and like would ask us questions like we'd go out on the balcony and look at the stars and we'd be like you know is there life out there do you think like was it one big bang or like what's dark matter what's dark energy so constantly like having us excited about looking at what's around us and asking questions by the way, sorry for the funny voice I was in for the past week. Just wanted people to know why my voice like goes randomly. And then when I was, yeah. And then I think my first, well, my first physics class was my last year of high school. And I just knew I was going to love it. I was like, there's a practicality to it. There's the math. There's also exciting things in the future, like quantum computers and discovering what, like all these mysteries in the world. So that's what got me like excited. And throughout it though, people kept saying I had to choose one or the other. You know, I had really amazing dance mentors, but they're like, if you want to become like a top dancer, like you need to quit the physics. And same with the physics, they're like, you're dancing way too much, but I just couldn't let it go. And so I was kind of like doing both, but in secret. You've and talked like, a little bit trying to about like when you were doing both how they actually helped each other. Could you explain a little bit more about that? So it ended up being a really good thing that you, you stuck with them both. I think it's so important or not important, but I think it's very valuable and helpful to have two passions. So there are multiple things. I think there are multiple layers to how it was helpful. One, why it was helpful was because I think with anything that we pursue, we improve, which is the fun, exciting part. But then we also plateau. Like there's a period and it, and the plateaus get longer, the higher up you go, the better you get, the plateaus become longer. And I think it's really hard to sit through the plateaus without it psychologically doing this in. Like, I think if that's your main focus and there's no improvement, I think we start to lose that like adrenaline, that motivation. And then we start doubting and that's when we kind of like dip, but the nice thing of having two passions is like when I plateau with this, then the other thing's improving and then that plateaus. And so I never really feel the weight of a plateau, if you know what I mean. So there's a little bit of a distraction that just like on a big thing helped. But also like physics was so helpful for dance. Like I don't think I would have made it as a professional ballet dancer if I didn't have physics. I would just visualize where my center of mass is, where the moment of inertia, the torque, just like all of these things, I would like start to just subconsciously think about while I was dancing that I found super helpful. And then the second thing was in the lab, 
there was this one contest called Dance Your PhD. And I started to choreographing and dancing about like, what was my PhD about? Like, and I, my PhD was creating single photons entangled particles of light and having them entangled. So I did this dance called Entangoed and we did a tango of like these two entangled particles, but it just made me, cause when I was choreographing, I was like, okay, when are these particles produced? Like if you have a very strong laser going into, you know, is, does it happen in the beginning, the middle, the end? And it just, it made me think about the dispersion, the wave packets of it and all of these things. So that's how it was helpful. Oh, wow. So designing that dance actually helped you with the theory and when you were thinking about physics itself as well? Totally. Because I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, when the particles exit, like it depends where they were on the crystal. So like a little doggy side is like there's dispersion in the crystal. And so if the particles are, or the photons are created at the beginning, they'll have a different wavelength by the time they exit the crystal than if they happen at the end of the crystal. And so it made me go back and like analyze the pot, like the laser light. And it made me analyze all these things that like actually fixed my pH, my experiment and like, let me get a PhD. Oh, wow. And that must have been such an exciting moment to bring the two together. Tell us a little bit about the challenges, because maybe ex outside of uh, this dance that you're talking about, there was a lot of separation between the two. And you've mentioned before that you've had to hide, you know, the physics from the dancers and, the, and dance from the physicists. And what are the sort of unique challenges that you faced in, in either physics or ballet? So for sure, I think the hardest thing are the doubts and the uncertainty, especially at the beginning, right? So the hard part for me was definitely putting in so many hours into physics and not knowing if it was going to work out for years, right? Putting so many hours into physics for years. Also then putting in so many hours for dance and like lots of sacrifice, like I didn't socialize at all. Like I, it was just physics and dance, like, and minimal amount of sleep. And it was very, it was quite intense. Yeah. So I think it was the doubts that were the hardest and I had a very hard time with that. And that, like, I, I think anything worthwhile, it goes through a very long period where you're putting in a lot of work and you don't see the outcome from it per se. And so it was getting through those that helped, like that was the toughest part. And I think advice for that is, I call it the three month rule, where if I'm, if I really feel like I've hit the end or I'm like, I don't think I'm improving anymore. I don't think I'm going to make it. Like this, this really sucks. Like I want to quit. I give myself the three month rule, which is, okay, I'm allowed to quit in three months. But in those three months, I have to give, I have to give a hundred percent and I have to go like, just not even a hundred, like a thousand percent where I give everything I've got at it for three months. And if I don't improve, then I'm allowed to quit. But the thing is that I think it's just like waiting it through those, as I call the plateaus. <laughs> and so after three months of giving something a thousand percent, there's always something magical that happens. There's always some improvement there's always like you always kind of get over it so that's like one thing that would get me through the doubts and then the second thing was like I just wanted to be when I'm older like not have regrets that I didn't give it my all I think I had heard enough kind of when I was at the dance studios there's enough like elderly women who would come to me and say Oh, I'm so sad. Like I loved dance and then I quit because I thought it was bad, but I was actually really good. And it's just, and I was like, oh, that kind of regret I think would be hard because you can't go back in time and change it. So I was like, at least if I'm in this position now, I want to give it everything I've got. And maybe I won't get into any company. That was my thought was like, maybe it won't work out, but like at least, you know, when I'm 60, 70, I want to be on a beach with a pina colada thing like. I tried. I had my own limitations. It didn't work out, but like, at least I'm not looking back, like kicking myself for not giving my all. I love that mentality. I think like for everyone here, whatever you're working on, even if it's nothing to do with dance or physics, I think the idea of having a set period, um, for example, three months where you're just giving it your all and seeing if it works out is, is a really great thing to do. 
And I'm so glad you did yeah. because you've now done this really exciting thing, blending uh, your dance and robotics. So if I understand correctly, before the pandemic, you did this six week residency at Harvard Art Labs. And th that was your first focus on the intersection between dance and robotics. So we'd love to hear a bit more about that. And also you can uh, sort of talk about how that's evolved uh, on, to your lockdown project, essentially. And there's also, I see in the chat, like, there's a big question about Alexandra tying in, which is like, didn't I find it difficult to raise awareness about STEAM, both STEM and non-STEM industries? So this kind of like ties into that perfectly. So yeah, I had done this residency at Harvard Art Lab. It's an amazing space where they had artists just to research. Like there was no pressure to create a performance, no pressure to have like a viewing. It was literally just to research. And it gave me that freedom to then explore new technologies, to try things that would be too risky if I had to do a performance. Like there's, you know, the frontier of technology, like you just don't play with that stuff when you need to do a performance because you need things to be reliable and, and like, you know, cutting edge technology is not reliable. So I we had that art lab and I was playing around with this industrial robotic arm and it was, I was just like intrigued by how it could inspire create human, like my own human creativity, how it could inspire new movement, what human robot interaction looked like. And it was right before the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit. And I was like, all my dance gigs got canceled. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like this is terrible. Because it was like quite devastating for the dance world. But then I was like, you know what? Funny thing is I was just dancing with an industrial robotic arm. And robots don't get COVID. So we're going to see if I can get a robot here to my tiny apartment in London during the pandemic. So to and just, you know, it was like, it was total months actually to persuade this robot company to lend me a robot. Like I had to, I linked in everyone. I like constantly was like, hey, I know it sounds strange, but like, I think you want to lend your robot to a dancer, you know, like, I, and for them, they are like, no, we we actually don't want to do that because that's silly. Like n none of our, we want to sell robots and we're doubtful that the, like there are many dancers out there that want to buy like a $25,000 robot, right? Like they're like, yeah, like, mm, no, you're like not our market at all. And I was like, but I think you actually do want me dancing with the robots. And so they, after a couple months, they were like, okay, we'll lend it to you for two weeks. And in those two weeks, like I created a bunch of little short videos for social media and those videos got viral. So it was getting like a million views, 14 million views, like just a bunch of views and their robot videos, which is like a robot picking up something and dropping it with like, I don't know, back a lot of views, like 200 views. And so then when it was time for me to return the robot, they're like, actually you can keep the robot because <laughs> i was just creating a lot of excitement around the robot and i think it they recognize that you know although they're trying to sell the robots to people that like wanted to lift and drop things like there are all these other barriers around it like i think there was a fear of humans near robots but showing like me dancing next to a robot i think they were like okay if this girl can dance next to a robot how scary can they be, right? So it was like, it was breaking down a lot of the barriers that they hadn't even registered. And also then it was like, I was able to do quite intricate movements with the robot. So then people are like, oh, actually, it's not just a silly, you know, it can do more sophisticated things, but by showing it through an art. So in that sense, I think they had been a little bit narrow-minded and I think sometimes it can be, but like sometimes you just have to be like, Hey, I'm not leaving Bill. We try this <laughs> plop and then we can call it quits. But like, let's just try. And so in that sense, now they like, they like keep the robot, you know, like do whatever you want with it because they, I think they recognize that. And also as well, like answering that question is like, when I started dancing with the robots, a lot of my, I would say dance mentors, the people around me were a bit discouraging actually to the point where I stopped 
for like two weeks because I was just quite down about it because it wasn't esteemed as like what high artists do, right? Like I was doing these fun social media posts and they're like, what are you doing? Like, that's not high end art. Um, and I just realized like, actually, you know, Einstein has a very smart quote. He says like, the highest form of research is play. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to use play. I'm going to play and like learn about robots, work with roboticists and pursue research in that way, but from a playful aspect. And also in terms of like arts, like I think the future of arts is incorporating some of this technology. And so integrating that, but through play. Of course. I think that's, that, that's so important because you were able to actually change their perceptions of these boundaries between art and science. And even if, for example, they weren't getting involved in art, you could have opened their mindset to how it can be used in different yeah. ways. So yeah. I think that's great. We have another question in the chat, actually. So someone's asking, what, in your opinion, is a way to encourage young autistic people to educate themselves more and explore STEM and to make STEM individuals is explore and appreciate art and to grow STEAM? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's my main complaint, I would say, about the education system for sure. And, and just like society now, in a way where it's like, oh, if you show signs of being creative when you're young, you have to do, you do art. And then if you show signs of being analytic, you do science. Without, you know, it's like, oh, they have a left brain or they have a right brain. And I'm like, dude, like, because it, it, like this whole mentality of, oh, you have a right brain or like left brain, like right? if we cut people's heads open, like, I'm just going to say like, <laughs> I'm assuming more people have both halves in there. Like, you know, like it's just, and this whole thing of, I found that it was so important when I was in the lab to be, have that creative aspect because you need new ideas to come up with like ways to problem solve, ways to visualize like quantum you know, like you need that imagination and creativity. And in the, in the dance studio, it was like so important to be analytic and be like, and not just do it a thousand times, which is sometimes the mentality, but being like, okay, I tried it with my foot this far apart. We're going to now try to turn like with a longer base, like we're going to try different things. And so that was like that. I hope that changes. And I think through examples that will slowly change. But I think my main things is like the importance of creativity no matter what nowadays. Like the education system has taught us to answer questions, memorize facts, and regurgitate them. And I'm like, we're gonna, we can't compete with Siri and Alexa. Like you can ask Siri and Alexa, all that stuff. And they're just, you know, and I think fundamentally when we're learning, we're like, we can look this up. Like why? Mm. But so we've been taught how to answer a thousand questions. But I think the important thing is like learning how to ask questions, which comes from that fusion of science and art. You know, it's like you look back at Einstein, like the greatest science breakthroughs, like Einstein. And he, when he came with his breakthrough, like he didn't start with the math. He started with like imagining himself as a photon on a light beam and then being like looking at the electromagnetic waves being like what would happen if i look forward like looking back and it came up with special relativity right like but it was like asking questions from imagining himself on in a light beam right or elon musk being like asking good questions being like why are rockets so expensive how do we make it cheaper can we reuse them and boom like spacex is formed right it's like all about asking questions which were just not taught at school and I think it comes from and so the hope is like I think if like you know the the if we see things from the artistic side see things from the scientific side we get to ask more better questions and um, push both of the fields further and hopefully like also intertwine them. absolutely that that's a really great way of putting it and I think in particular, I appreciate how you touched upon the role of the education system. And that's another idea we're exploring later in the conference, uh, the future models of education, how we can break out of this, you know, memorize and regurgitate model. But I'd be really interested to know, so you've experienced studying at Harvard and Oxford. How do you compare the two? And between the two, do you think one maybe fostered that culture of 
innovation and collaboration a little more than the other? Or do you think they, they were fairly similar? I think there are pros and cons to both. So like, yeah, the American system at Harvard and the British system in the UK. So definitely I really appreciated at Harvard. It was like, you did not have to decide your major to like the end. It was actually mandatory to take history, a philosophy class, English class, like language class, math. You had to take a course in everything and they make it fun. Like, and so in that sense, I really appreciated my time at Harvard in just the breadth and like, you know, they would fuse things together, like whatever society you wanted to make, you could do it. And whatever classes you wanted to take, you could do it and you could double major and all these things. So that I really appreciated. What I appreciated about doing my PhD in the UK though, was that there was just a, I think a healthier mentality to how people spend their time and the work-life balance. So in the US, I was working at a lab in my undergraduate, but like I felt guilty if I was not at the lab at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night, like, cause the whole lab was there. But the crazy thing is like the whole lab is there, but no one's like, they're all on Facebook. You know, like <laughs> there's this whole like, oh, I'm at the lab 24 seven, but are they really doing work? Like I think- And that's that, when you snuck off to do ballet? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was like, well, okay, do we need to be here? <laughs> I think it's so strange. You know, but there's this whole mentality of like, Oh, I'm working so hard, but like, you need a little bit of free, like you need a little space to be creative, right? You can't be like, everything can't be packed. Otherwise that creativity is like, so, so that was the down part of America. Whereas in the UK, I felt like there was, it was like at lunch, we, our lunches would sometimes be three hours long because someone had an interesting idea about this paper and we would just talk about it leisurely, like yeah, you know, philosophically and like, there wasn't this like craziness and also you could work on the weekends, but there wasn't, it was like, uh, it, it, the whole, not an external pressure to do that. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't like this guilt, you know, people were like, actually it's important. Like, I think there was an importance in taking time off that I felt being in the UK that, and, and the thing is looking at the two, like they published, you know, papers in the same paper like in the same you know magazines and and had you know they published like equal work so those like the pros and cons of it there was like it was just interesting to experience oh thank you so I'm I'm going to ask you one other question a bit linked to that but we have a couple of questions in the chat so I'll move to those afterwards but just on the route of sort of comparing different cultures you've also danced with a lot of different ballet companies across the world so I'd be really interested to know, did you find different sort of cultures in the different companies? And did you disclose your sort of scientific achievements to some and not others? Were they accepting? Yeah. So the, the real, the fun thing about ballet companies is it is so international, no matter what country you're in. So I danced, you know, Zurich Ballet and then Boston, English National Ballet and Norwegian National Ballet. But I've also performed in like China and Asia and all over the place. So the companies themselves tend to be super international, like from Russia, from Argentina, from Brazil, from like all over Europe. And in, so in that sense, it tends to be very fun. I've definitely experienced and witnessed the change in culture as the Me Too movements have become stronger, as, as all these discussions about equality have been discussed. I think there are things in the past that I've witnessed that wouldn't and, and witnessed from a director and then 10 years later had the same interaction with the director and they are totally different because you can tell they do not want to lose their job. <laughs> you know, whereas I think there's a cockiness before hmm. and just like an entitlement before that now you know, like, I think there were situations where nothing happened, but like, I was like, that was a use of power and a bit, you know, uncomfortable. Whereas being in the exact same setting, they acted totally different. But I think it's this whole like thing, like, okay, you know, 
actually someone has now said what is right and what is wrong. And I think maybe there's ambiguity before, but it's just like an interesting thing where it's in, in the sense that that has changed. And also I'm noticing there is a lot more interest in some of the tech stuff as well and like an openness to it. Actually, the two female directors I had were, were quite interested by that. Like Norwegian National Ballet, they said that they weren't having any auditions, but the fact that I had a physics PhD, they invited me to come audition because they were just wow. like, huh. And so it was just funny where I was like, apparently that my physics PhD was going to get me into a ballet company. Like, <laughs> Come here. I told to enter the door to audition. It's like, it's proving really loads of people wrong. Ballet. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's very hard to even get in the door to the, to even audition. So in that sense, and I think some things are slow and you know, some things will take time and the cultures are different for sure. And, and also to say like, you know, there's, and it's not just, again, like, I, I think I brought up like the female thing, but like, you know, one director, he was gay. And so actually he preyed on young boys. So it's not just like, I just wanted to say like, you know, boys and girls, I think are equally affected by it, but actually but the times have changed and like, I think it's improved for everyone. Yeah. And you've seen that across the board in the different companies. Yeah, I, I see that. I think it's really helped in terms of like people not taking advantage or just being a bit more aware of like what's appropriate in their roles. Yeah, for sure. Thinking twice. We have time for maybe one or two questions. We have quite a few in the chat. So one question is, do you see robots being incorporated in the dance industry and in theaters around the world, especially considering how popular your content is? Of course, it's not that easy to uh, acquire a robot like you did, but do you think we're going to, we're going to see it come up more and more as you've had some really interesting projects uh, recently where you've been able to incorporate and show off your dances with robots? So. What do you think? I think it definitely will be incorporated more. It just adds like a different perspective and newness. I would say, I think some people get afraid that robots will replace humans. And I would say there's nothing that will replace a human-human duet. It's just a different way. So the example I use is like, you know, painters, I think they were terrified when the camera came out, right? They're like, oh my God, all our jobs are going to be taken. Like no one's going to ever want a painting. Like there's this camera that can do it in like five seconds. But, you know, I think it's shown that actually it's just another, it's a tool for human expression, a like human creativity. Like it's just a different way. And we still, you know, in the same way that we appreciate and, and celebrate painters and their work, you know, like photography, I think we celebrate the photographers who are using the tools to just like, you know, like give us different perspectives and, and have us look at things in a different way. And um, so I think in the same way, robots and technology will become part of art, but it won't take away from the humanness, I want to say. Like, I think there'll still be that connection. And, but it has been super interesting. Like the latest piece I did was in Paris and it was, a, for me, the most emotional thing I've ever performed in my life. And it was with this robot. But I think it's because the robot doesn't have emotion. So it forces me to tap into stuff that's like super deep. Like if I was dancing with another human, I think I would have used material that's a bit lighter because you can still feel that connection. Whereas now I was like, oh God, I got to go. Because the robots aren't giving any emotion unless I do when we can like hmm. work together in the way. So I had to go super deep and like bring stuff out that I was like, oh my God, this is hard. But it was, it was fun as not like it, it was just, it was interesting. It was a good challenge. Yeah. It sounds like it's unlocked some new skill sets because as well, when you're dancing with a human, they can respond to you. You can respond to them. Whereas you have to be very focused with the robot because it's not going to respond to you. We have a, another question. What would you say to someone that feels stressed about pursuing both art and STEM because it feels stressful enough to do only one? <laughs> I, yeah, stress is a big thing. I think it's so important. I've had a lot of mentors just be like, there are a couple of things. One is 
they're like just horse blinders on, right? Like you just need the horse blinders, see what you want to improve. A little thing you improve, you focus on that, you improve. Focus on like little things that you can prove yourself that make you happy and just, it's really like, but you got to block out all the noise because there's so many things and you know, it shows up on social media as well. It's like, there's so much pressure to be brilliant right away, I think. And it's such a shame because I think a lot of things take time. So I'm like, give yourself time. Like, yeah, there's pressure to show brilliance right away. And then, oh, if you're not brilliant right away, like, if not for you, do something else, right? Like, and, and I also saw it for myself, right? Like BBC, a couple of years ago, BBC was like, breaking news. We discovered this physicist ballerina in our Oxford lab, right? <laughs> and but the thing was like my friends messaged me and they're like this is the least breaking news i have ever seen because we've been doing this for like over 10 years you know like we've been doing this for a decade hmm. i know but like things come out like oh it looks like it was like immediate um without acknowledging being like actually i took like 10 years of like not knowing if i was gonna make it kind of thing right and even still like i obviously still have goals and stuff that are like well, I don't know if this is going to work out, but I guess we'll just try. And so I think with the stress is also, I make sure to be very kind to myself. And so I would just like offer that as well, being like, look, the only thing you can do is you give your all, right? You give your all, you make your little improvements, like tug along. And if it doesn't work out, like it, it doesn't, but like, I think the hard thing is if you look back and you're like, oh, it doesn't work out and questioning, oh, but if I had, hmm, if I had worked a bit more, like that part I think would be hard. So that's why I'm like, just give a thousand percent, like jump in with joy and excitement. Like, yeah, it might not work out. But the other thing is I promise like every hour of work pays off in the end. And there's so many things that I've been disappointed by or haven't gotten. But when I look back, I'm like, it's actually good because there was another opportunity that was better and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I, the other thing had worked out. So it's just sticking it through. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Merit. That's a great note to end on. So don't be so hard on yourself and be patient when you see things a lot later on based on the effort you're putting in now. Thank you so much for being with us. Everyone, oh. really, if you've been as interested as we all have about Merit's mix of science and art, you should check out her movement at Sci Art Party. They host meetings of people that are interested in blending the two so you'll meet other like-minded people focusing on innovation in this area. Thank you again, Merit. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a blast. <laughs>